The song's so catchy. Every time we're just like, yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Welcome back, everybody, to the Virtual Crate Podcast. Uh, I'm I'm John, and I'm back again with Dusty, because Dusty just can't stay away. I actually live here. Yeah, we're 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 snuggle buddies. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a whole episode on that. Yeah. Uh we'll do a an MTV Cribs episode one day where we can show our bunk bed. <laughs> <laughs> Which we are laying in right now. How you doing today, Dusty? I'm doing well. How yeah. about yourself? Ah, uh, you know, another day, another Snickers. <laughs> yeah. Do you have Snickers? There's a whole bunch of them. Oh, how did I miss that? How did I miss that? Yeah, um, feel free. There's Snickers and Starburst. I like to have snacks for myself and specifically when I know people are coming over to the podcast, I try to have yeah. snacks of some sort. I'm just such a candy kid. <laughs> <laughs> I always have candy around. Um so enjoy Snickers or Starburst if you'd like. This is the the Starburst are from the pink bag. Unfortunately, <laughs> and I'm gonna go off here for a second. This is unscripted, folks. The best Starbursts are the Summer Splash Starburst, and those are only seasonal. And I might do a whole show about that. <laughs> um, I've loved Starburst since day one of my life. I'm pretty sure my mom ate one when she was pregnant with me, <laughs> and that's all I would accept is food from then on. Um, and I'm really sad that the Summer Splash are not available, but we got the pink bag. It's all of the, the pink and red ones, it's but I don't think these are cherry. I think it's like a fruit punch or something. It looks glorious. Because, oh no, it is cherry. You know, bullshit. <laughs> it's my least favorite. <laughs> um Candy aside, we are here because Disney owns Star Wars. Yeah, uh, and yeah. that's it. See, you, see you guys yeah. later. All right, you guys, uh, <laughs> take care, love one another, have a good day. So, what it, what have you been watching, Dusty? You know, I wrapped up the Mandalorian. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. I haven't seen it. I um. <laughs> <laughs> I highly suggest you do if you haven't. Can we pause real quick and just binge the whole series? Yeah. <laughs> Shit, we're already cuddling in bed. What the, what the fuck? <laughs> On this week's episode of Cuddling with John. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did actually watch The Mandalorian. Uh, I've seen some of the episodes a couple of times because I watched it in real time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I've watched some of the episodes uh, over and over. I haven't binged the full series over, but uh, I will probably be doing that shortly. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna. I'll give it some time, and I'm definitely gonna do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So jump into it. What, what? Tell me what you uh, what you thought about the Mandalorian. Initial thoughts, directing, acting. Yeah. All that stuff. Uh, first of all, just very thankful. It was soothing. Yeah. Um, you know, for those of you who don't know, I grew up with Star Wars. Um, you know, so I was born in 77. So when, uh, Return of the Jedi came out, I was old enough to see it in the theater and the rest is history. Um, and including what damage has been done <laughs> recently. Um, and six movies later. <laughs> yes. Um, it was just a breath of fresh air mm -hmm. for me. Um, yeah, it was great. I was very excited. Um, John, how do you pronounce his last name? Fair John Favreau. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And thank you, John. <laughs> yes, from both of us, from the <laughs> bottom of our heart, thank you for everything you've done in the last handful of years. Because also, we don't have um, the MCU without John Favreau. He directed the first two Iron Man movies. Oh. And he was the one that fought for Robert Downey Jr. to be Iron Man. Awesome. This Did guy's not know been that. killing it for for a long time. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, well, thank you, Disney. Yeah, for bringing him on because whew, it, it was it was good. Um, and then for you know, again, my generation. For those of you that really truly believed Apollo Creed died, he's back. <laughs> 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 he is back, and he is bad. I, I I enjoyed Carl Weathers. I mean, 
good old stubs yeah uh he's a little rusty with a uh pistol but you know yeah. other than that it was very awesome to see him back on the big screen and you know what's funny i saw this also um move into another character or actor i saw this a year ago and i totally forgot about pedro pedro pascal yes oh man he's he's the doinish he what the dornishman the dornishman yeah. is that, is that, was that they called him yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> he's from door and he gets his eyes exploded <laughs> that yeah that was one badass bisexual i'll tell you that <laughs> <laughs> i mean a lot of people love that character on game of thrones he a was lot it, for, awesome it, i was sad have, when he died if you have, if you're not familiar we're talking about pedro pascal who voices the mandalorian and uh plays him in a lot of the costume there there's talk of stunt people we'll get into that in for minute. sure yeah. but um he he was on game of thrones as the red viper and oh man what I know it's kind of written in a certain way for that character, but man, what an underutilized <laughs> character. <laughs> yeah, I, so sad to see him go. Yeah. Um, I, I, actually, did you see him in... He's been in a lot of stuff. He's going to be in Wonder Woman 84 that comes out later this year. Too. No. I think he's the villain in Wonder Woman. Um, How about Norcos? I haven't watched any Norcos. Ooh. I hear that's great. That's one of those shows. If you haven't watched Norcos watch it yeah that's that's one on my list that i just everybody keeps telling me i need to, to get on and yeah my he, list keeps he getting plays a da agent uh -huh. and oh, gosh he's so he's he's i i, I you know what now i think about it, as if i can meet one actor it'd be that guy yeah he seems cool as he shit really cool. and you know cool yeah and uh he was in uh the kingsman sequel <laughs> did you see oh. that yeah he's like uh one of the american agents in that um which is uh the first movie's better in my opinion but uh yeah he's in it <laughs> <laughs> so the uh um, big fan big so the fan. mandalorian is uh pedro pascal's in the suit uh for some of it and i th from there's been a lot of different directors um through for each episode uh of the mandalorian and um Bryce Dallas, Bryce Dallas Howard, uh, Ron Howard's daughter, directed one of the episodes, and she, really? yeah, she came out and said that uh, it was a stunt actor, uh, mostly in the costume, on uh, her episode that they shot. Which I mean, it's fine. You don't need to see him when he's got the helmet on, everything. Like, cool, just give me cool action stuff. But one of the stunt people is, um, I forget his first name, but it's um, uh, one of John Wayne's grandsons, oh, I no believe. Way. Yeah, and I was like, that's just so cool. Considering this, this is like a Western. Yeah. Like, this is such a Western space movie. It, yeah. It's a, it's a total a to John it. Wayne movie. Great way and to put his, it. And his like, son or grandson is, is in it. I don't know. I, I nerd, nerded out on that. Uh, but um, yeah. yeah uh, little, little nerdy insights. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I... Um, again, I'm going to just... I, I keep touching on new and i'm starving for new mm -hmm. with star wars um past is the past let's move on let's still take an amazing story and let's you know kick some ass with it and this was to me um well you know I always go back to rogue one was great yeah um you know and then um and and i'm gonna say this one is up there with it um although it's not a movie it's a series but mm -hmm. you know um yeah it, they that was it was really exciting um a great story about a, a bounty hunter and uh, is basically you know um paid to by an is it there are they imperials it's still imperial right no um this th so this movie or this movie this show takes place like i think it's five or six years after return of the jedi so the imperials are scattered okay so um you have luke leia and han are in are alive in in their primes technically in this time period there's a there's a chance you could bring in and i not that i want to see any of that but there's a chance you could bring in like a luke a younger luke on his mission there's been i did not know that yeah there's been fan uh uh, uh castings for uh, a younger luke and um i i i don't disagree with this but um 
Sebastian Stan, who plays the Winter Soldier, looks like a young Mark Hamill. Oh, like they have yeah. such similar uh, facial yeah. features, and I mean, he's. I think he does a great job as the Winter Soldier. Right. I, I'm not super. Um, I haven't seen a lot of his other stuff. I've seen him in a couple of things, and he was in um. He was in the first episode of a show on Showtime about the comedy store that Jim Carrey produced. I think it's called I'm Dying Up Here. He's in the first episode of that, and it's pretty good. Um, but yeah, that's in, it's in that time period. So you could, let's say, bring in you know one of those three main characters into this time period. But they set it up that they don't need to, and I, and I like that. Yeah, I totally agree. As you know, um, so that's interesting because I hear I'm like, oh, the future. So you're putting it back into the. Well, this is this is uh, this is. Uh, they have a hard time leaving this time period. It seems like yeah, you know, t- telling these stories, and this is the one so far, aside from maybe Rogue One, that I'm like, cool, I want to see this because Rogue One still ties into storyline, but it's people we don't know. It's a whole story we didn't even know what happened to them at the end. We had no idea, and they keep it its own story yeah, too, completely, which is, which is great. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, it's uh bounty hunter who's paid to you know bring in an asset to um you know some bad people i'll I'll just say the imperial yeah yeah Uh, no uh, there's there's still like factions of them around and i mean because he has stormtroopers the skywalker there seems to be thousands of ships somewhere (laughs) (laughs) just hiding in a garage (laughs) yeah um yeah because this guy had stormtroopers around him yeah um and kind of breaks his code Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. but then he doesn't in in a way because this creature this little baby how can you not he saved him right the baby okay this i'm just gonna say baby yoda we'll we'll use the term of endearment now so far there's no name for it yeah i tried to look that up and i there's no name for the species nothing there's just the only other ones we have in canon are yoda and then there was another i think female on the jedi council at the same time named yaddle and then Uh. in like the legends books i think there's one other one that's been mentioned or something but no idea what the species name is okay nothing like it's it's still that's what i was and actually that was one thing um george set in motion is he didn't really want to touch yoda's species much he he just didn't want to do it yeah. And I think that's important, uh, as we were talking about from last week's episode, the Watchmen, it's important to end things sometimes, or just keep yes. an air of mystery about stuff, and I kind of want that with Yoda, and mm-hmm. um, if you're going to bring in, you know, a new little thing, please, like, uh, yeah, I, I still don't need to know his, his species, really, I just want to know what's up. <laughs> right, um, yeah, so that's that's what's great. So yeah. baby Yoda, which is not Yoda or you know We could but... call him Steve if you want. Yeah. Hey, so little baby Steve over here <laughs> <laughs> who saves Mando. Mm-hmm. And so in a way he's not really breaking his his code because hey, you saved me. Yeah. Okay, now I'm, I got to be loyal to you. Yeah. And that's where it really starts of him you just, you know, you see the sensitive side yeah. where, no, I'm going to protect, yeah. you know, Steve. <laughs> Baby Steve. Steve. <laughs> Baby Steve. Steve. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, th- I do think there's maybe one other element to that, too. Of I mean, not only do you fall in love with that thing the second you see it. I wish I remember seeing that episode because I, I downloaded the Disney app the day it came out. And mm-hmm. I watched the first episode the second I got it. And, um, and I remember seeing, seeing the baby Yoda thing and I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. (laughs) I was, I was super bummed about it. Um, but I think another thing that you start to see as the kind of story unfolds a little bit is that I think he sees a little bit of himself in there too. So you start getting flashbacks of the Mandalorian as a kid and like, you know, his parents, uh, basically the, the, um, the separatist to the battle droids come in and wherever he's at, they're blowing up his, his whole, and his parents put him in a little like a uh, bunker or something. And then pretty much the second the door closes, an explosion seemingly kills them. Um, and I, I do think there's a little bit of that like orphan thing, like, Oh, this is an orphan too. And he's adorable. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great connection. I didn't even think about that. That's really, yeah. Cause I mean, yeah. and and 
they uh this show does a lot for the Mandalorian lore, like the history of the Mandalore culture itself. There's been a little bit. We only in the original trilogy. There's pretty much only Boba Fett. Right. It's a big mystery. And then they sure. get a a tiny bit into it in the clone of uh, the um the prequel trilogy and like uh, the clone army and stuff like that. How they're clone from Jango Fett or whatever. Right. Um. But uh, the Clone Wars uh series animated series gets into a lot more uh mandalorian history and they kind of dive into it a little bit more in here i thought they might have been contradicting themselves but they really set it up as mostly the culture is like mostly it seems accepted uh uh, just like pulling in orphans you know here's you're an orphan you don't have a family or uh or or whatever come with us right and be part of our our creed right and um I, I I like that they've done that. Like Mandalore, there there is a planet. There's a Mandalore planet, um, and it's 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 not about the planet. It's about like, yo, you need you need a family too. <laughs> we'll show you how to be a badass. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Do you know how to use a flamethrower? <laughs> Let me teach you. <laughs> Wait, how about and a jet pack? Yeah, and I could fly while yeah. doing it. Okay, where do I sign? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we see him lean into those tools a few times. In the yeah, show, and I'm fully down. <laughs> oh, so good. But so, yeah, they so exp- many good battle they, scenes. They expand the lore in this too a lot. Um, and they just they're they're telling us a little bit a little bit of lore that maybe some people did know and some people didn't know and they expand on it but oh man um they they this is like you said a breath of fresh air for Star Wars fans like this is i think everything people have been asking for something new that's not that's maybe vaguely connected but like it's its own thing and yeah. still within the universe uh-huh yeah. and i think there's a big thing to be said to to if we're going if you, if you have a point you want to get to i can i can talk about this later but no, i do think that going. this this medium in general of doing star wars as a series tv series is really really helpful to star wars fans and really important to the overall story because i think some of these Having to fit a trilogy or, you know, individual movies. Sometimes you just don't get to tell the stories you want. And we're getting much more than just a straight story. We're getting world building. We're getting side characters. We're getting all the things that makes Star Wars cool. Is There's a, a really cool, solid character to follow in this world that's super interesting, you know. And if, if we were driving our cars around anywhere in the star wars universe you and i would just be like oh my god did you see that alien? look at that alien over there oh my god there's, there's bones over in the sand what's going on over here i'm drinking blue milk <laughs> yeah and and i mean all that side stuff's really cool to see um and they you get to expand on some of that stuff in this series so i'm really glad that um we're getting this kind of format for the star wars uh universe because there's there's a lot to get through uh Mm -hmm. there's a lot they can tell i mean man disney could sit in this time frame for another in our times they could just be telling within this time frame in the star wars universe and i i feel like it's a little outplayed at this point but they could continue if they found the right creative yeah yeah i'm sorry but be fucking creative and don't half-ass it. Correct. Right? <laughs> Plan it out a little Plan it out. Bit. Yeah. Don't brush it. But Because, I, yeah. Yeah. Well, in the current state of the Star Wars fandom that we live in now, I think this is the thing that's maybe, you know, uh, putting some water on the on the, the flames of his mad his fandom hysteria mm-hmm. um, towards maybe how they felt about either Last Jedi or... Or the Rise of Skywalker, whatever. I, I think this is helping the fandom a lot. But, For sure. But I don't know. Continue. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it was also impressive because, obviously, Mandalorian, he's got mm-hmm. a helmet on. So <laughs> you're talking the majority of the series, a character with a helmet. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the directing on this to create this character that you um connect with and you start rooting for and start really like having some love for 
but you don't know who the fuck it is. Yeah. He's got a helmet the whole time. Yeah. So the way they shot these scenes and um, it, that I don't even know how to explain it. I, you know, I'm not in the movie industry. I, I don't know film. I didn't study film and mm-hmm. all that. So I'm probably butchering how. Um, um, Get out. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you can leave now. <laughs> <laughs> excuse me um it, it it was it was really well done um do you know what other movie maybe judge dread a dude with a helmet on the yeah. whole fucking time yeah pretty much what what other i mean you tell me what other movies out there where there's a character the whole fucking time with a helmet on that you connect with and and the only other thing i can think of that maybe vaguely connects is when they do the there's only been a couple of them but there was uh like some first person shooter style movies there was i think there's a movie called hardcore henry where like the the viewer was that the character oh you never see them oh okay because of that really yeah i i I don't see those movies but yeah there's there's not many out there and those are hard to do because video game movies are that's that's a whole nother conversation. Right. There's not really been a good video game movie. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, you're 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 right. Like Judge Dredd might be the only big one anybody can really think of other than this. Yeah, it, and so you know just really well done. And then, and then again, I totally forgot that you know Pedro is technically playing him. So when yeah. they do reveal him, I uh, you know, I'm in my room late at night watching that episode and i literally was like yes <laughs> <laughs> oh that guy <laughs> wait a minute he gonna, yeah. where'd your eyes come from yeah. i thought they got blown up <laughs> <laughs> yeah. damn he looks good for being dead for three years um i think in both kingsman and norco does he have a mustache oh yeah he looks sick. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah no i just wanted to see him with a mustache when he pulled the, <laughs> the mask on He's yeah like, what's up homie yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can just see his age and they're like Pedro you gotta shave the fucking mustache he's like no <laughs> he's like I'm gonna go shoot Norcos after this yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh man uh, yeah um, so uh, uh, yeah that was just um, really exciting it was just really exciting um, a lot of fun cool characters um, you know I've uh, with the exception of one movie um, I've never been a Nick Nolte fan. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's fair. <laughs> I, I, uh, I mean, and then I think I did try to watch 48 Hours recently, and it was a little hard. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, I love that movie. But did just... you watch the director's cut? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. And that's when I turned it off. Um, uh, but that character... Uh, Creel... Creel, I, I Creel think... something like that. Yeah. yeah. Cool or yeah. Cool. I'm really bummed he died. He died, right? <sighs> yeah. Ah, yeah. I I was re- I thought he was going to be a sidekick with him for mm-hmm. quite a while. I'm not angry that he's dead. Um uh, cuz I love surprises like that. Um it's entertainment in my eyes. Um uh but yeah, that was a cool character. I I thought everything about that character was really cool. Um there was a lot of, even though for a short period of time that that character was you know in in the series i felt mm-hmm. like there was substance yeah yeah well i mean for a little bit there uh especially in the first couple episodes when you meet both the characters you meet the mandalorian and and that character um mandalorian doesn't doesn't talk a lot and so you're not getting emotion so much other than just like his action of taking the baby yoda or whatever um but you do really get like a verbalized sense of morals from from that character. He's kind of like, you know, uh, uh, Mandalorian's just like when he, when they first meet him and he's and and he's like, go take care of those dudes. Mm-hmm. And he's like, okay, I'll do it. And he's like, well, you have to learn how to ride this thing. And then there's like a small montage of him <laughs> learning how to ride that thing. Yeah. He's like, why can't I just fucking like go over there? And he's like, no, you're gonna need this thing. Yeah. Like, the like the voice of reason and logic and like also moral standpoint that he kind of played too i think worked to balance the two characters a little bit and i'm also sad at the outcome of that character too i was it was really suspenseful how they pulled it off too with the like chase of the um 
uh, well, I guess we can get into later episodes later, but how, how that all went down was, yeah. was really well done too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm going to bounce it back to you, but it's summing up by, it, it was just, um, a breath of fresh air. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What, what'd you, what was your take? I, I liked it a lot. I liked it for a lot of the same reasons. It's, it's, it's a new story for, for star Wars. It's outside of, um, you know, all the other lore and saga stuff that we've been hearing which i loved uh to a certain degree but i i think a lot of us fans are looking for something new um and they're doing it and uh, the only the only reservation i have is the time period you know it's the only thing is like cool they they stuck to the same time period we're all used to and know Mm -hmm. but um they, they they're they're doing it and they're doing it well and they're not they're using whatever characters we might or might know from Clone Wars and 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 things like that in small small amounts that um, for a lot of hardcore uh, fans that have read a lot of material or animated stuff, you're getting little bits of like oh they mentioned that planet that happened you know in in this mm-hmm. in, in this episode of the Clone Wars or whatever um, and that's really cool I really like that. Um, I think uh, some of the other stuff that impresses me about about the show is a lot of like behind the scenes stuff. Um, there's some actors that I personally like that I'm seeing get bigger American roles via Star Wars now. Um, in one of the episodes of Mandalorian, it might be episode six where they break in to they're trying to break a guy out of prison. Mm-hmm. Bill Burr is is in the episode. And I think that threw a lot of people off because they're like, why is he here with a Boston accent? <laughs> <laughs> and like, well, I mean, they all had British accents in the first movie. Yeah. So, uh, eh, yeah. <laughs> whatever. But, um, uh, like, that episode specifically has a lot of little, uh, 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 there's actors that pop up. Um, there's a, uh, the droid in that, I think his name is Zero. He's voiced by a guy named Richard Iowati. And, I know him through the Mighty Boosh and these other um, kind of weird uh, uh, surreal kind of BBC comedies from like the early 2000s. Oh. And like he hasn't had a whole lot of big success in the US. The, only, the biggest thing I think most most people would know him from is there's a show that you can find on Netflix called The It Crowd. And it's about uh, uh, an IT department at a company. And he's one of the IT guys. He's one of the main characters in that one. Um, but he got, he, he voices the robot and then, um, the twilight girl in that episode, she's the wildling girl from game of thrones. You know, I love these kinds of things just like those little people that pop up. But, um, the big, the biggest one at the end of that episode for me is, um, there's like three X-wing pilots that pop up at the end, um, to deal with whatever's going on and those three x-wing pilots are all directors for mandalorian episodes oh that's Dave awesome Filoni, um uh uh i'm gonna butcher his name rick famiua i think is his name he he did dope and he did a couple episodes of the mandalorian and then um deborah chow is the other one oh. and deborah chow is the one that's going to be handling the obi-wan series that's what i heard yeah yeah and her episodes of mandalorian are some of my favorite of the, the whole series yeah i mean the what everybody's that's the majority right now. Mm-hmm. The episodes she did were probably the best. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we'll go going back real quick um, to like the episode arcs. The first two, I think some people can say they might feel a little slow, kind of just building up what this story is about. But then episode three happens, and that's when he, I think that's when he takes Yoda, the little baby, back. He like gives it to the the Empire mm-hmm. and then steals it back. Mm-hmm. Um, and that not only do you see the character, uh, you know, kind of deciding his morals at that point, um, which I think are going to propel him into the rest of the Mandalorian story for future seasons too. Um, not only does uh, does he have this di- this dilemma, but this is where you see more Mandalorians come in too. That's the whole yes. episode where he's having that like shootout in the courtyard, and, and then all the fucking Mandalorians show up, and it's just like the coolest thing you've ever seen. And, and have his back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's... And actually, John Favreau voiced that one 
uh, Mandalorian. Oh, the, the, oh really? the bigger guy with the gun. Yeah. Uh, see, I got to rewatch that. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't make those connections. But Nerd. yeah, that was uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, that was a fun episode to kind of see the bounty hunters with, uh, and that's what's fun about this series is seeing what those bounty hunters mm-hmm. and their gear and their weapons what they're capable of yeah and you know we got a little hint of it with boba and then Django, but you know this was this was fun yeah yeah and um i was thinking about this recently because i rewatched uh before rise of skywalker came out i rewatched the og tri- well I, i've watched pretty much all i could um prequels and, and everything um and there's that scene in empire when vader is hiring all the bounty hunters and they're all just standing there and this 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 show feels like a, almost an extension of that that scene it's like you know vader is trying to get the story point across like he's trying to find these people but in that scene he's like telling them don't do this and then he looks at boba fett and he's like no disintegrations yeah. you know and yeah. like what does that mean? Right. And then he disintegrates. And then in the Mandalorian show, he, he's disintegrating people with that big ass gun. Yeah. He's got. I'm like, okay, yeah. more of this, please. So yeah, it felt like cool. That scene in, in, in empire, like it almost spawned. It, a it finally series. means something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that, and also just like the bounty hunter world too, you know, like in that scene, you see like six bounty hunters all standing there, like on the, uh, there for a bounty. But now you get to see more of that. You get right. to see the extended kind of world that they live in uh, based on that. And it's I actually it was really uh, interested to see how the whole thing worked with the... Um, they essentially have, like, key fobs <laughs> for their their, yeah. uh, their, uh, their missions yeah. or whatever. I was like, tell me more. Right. <laughs> how does this work? <laughs> yeah, you know, again, not lazy. I felt attention yeah. to detail. Um, and... On top of all that, which I'm really proud of Disney with this, is like filming on location, film sets, mm-hmm. and not everything is CG. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, it's a you know sci-fi, so there's a lot of it. But you know, episodes one through three was just all CG. Um, where this is fun, it's fun to see. You know, they they're filming on location there, and it just. Yeah um yeah i think that's that's one of the things that disney learned from the prequels i think that was one of the big takeaways after they acquired lucasfilm was they're like well the cg you guys do is you know groundbreaking and you can do a lot of cool stuff but Mm -hmm. you still all need to immerse yourself in the environment and not feel like it was shot on a green screen in a studio somewhere yeah and i i think i heard um most of the Mandalorians filmed he, like here in Southern California. What in yeah. Camarillo? <laughs> I wish, <laughs> right next to the hemp field. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that you losers are trying to get out of town. <laughs> yeah. Stupid idiots. Well, if you're in the Port Wayne area, stop by Wheelhouse Dispensary <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and ask for Dusty. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so you mentioned uh, filming here uh, in, in California. Do you know where in California? I don't. Uh, I want to say it's kind of out maybe like El Segundo or Long Beach area, somewhere oh, in there. Okay. Uh, it's kind of a little wide area, but <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff filmed in, in Southern California, yeah. but I, it wasn't one of the like more standard places that's filmed, like any of the movie ranches or anything. Right. Like, okay. As far as I understand. Yeah. But you know, it's funny. I research, I, right? <laughs> y- yeah. <laughs> Hashtag Google. Um, I heard a interview uh, before episode seven came out uh, with JJ Abrams. Mm-hmm. And I think his, he says his daughter was really young, like three years old or you know, four or around that that young age and he played uh empire Mm -hmm. for her and then he played uh i think episode two (laughs) and he 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 asked his daughter tell me which one is real Mm -hmm. and she was like uh empire yeah and you can feel it and so you know his whole thing was man if a three or four year old can figure that out that's huge and i don't want to film it this yeah. way and um kudos to disney for taking you know um just piggybacking off of that and right. keeping true to that because um 
it's fun you know they got the money to build sets. yeah well, yeah <laughs> yeah they built their own city within anaheim <laughs> <laughs> uh, pretty much yeah well i i, I think it would just to give George a little bit of leeway here, I think a lot of people give him crap for the prequels. But to be fair, when we're talking about Disney can afford to build sets, George Lucas could build sets too, but they were more focused in the technology aspect of filmmaking. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, uh, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but people that worked on Star Wars are responsible for like the Adobe stuff. Yes, um, Photoshop, some of the, the Skywalker sound. Yeah, all uh, people that worked on all that stuff are responsible for the, the way that consumers make media now. Like I'm recording this on Logic, and I'm sure somebody that worked on Star Wars had something to do with the development Absolutely. of this kind of software. Um, uh, yeah, and so that's they, the thing with they, episodes one through three. Uh, like for example, the a lot of it's choreographed, but the yeah. the fight scenes mm-hmm. and you know with the, all the Jedi's or um so a lot of it was cg but was, uh, those those scenes were great yeah, yeah i mean let's let's really see what i'm hoping for in season two with mandalorian is um samuel L. jackson coming back as the purple <laughs> lightsaber <laughs> yes fucking purple lights <laughs> uh, strike down upon i love that, that great was, <laughs> i love that that was like his request too like, yeah. he wanted the purple lightsaber, yeah. and I'm like, uh, you get a green or a red one or a blue, and he's like, no, motherfucker, I want a purple one. Yeah. <laughs> Good for you. And everybody scared of him was like, yeah, yeah, quick, get on that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, this, this, this show's doing a lot for the fandom, um, and, uh, and, uh, yeah, I don't know, what, you got any other, uh, well, insight on this? Y- y- you know, um just you know new characters that come in at the end mm-hmm. um giancarlo giancarlo Esposito. giancarlo i'm sorry gus. for butchering your name you can just call him gus God. <laughs> so i'm really disappointed on the first scene because it was the first time you see him it was kind of the end of the episode right yeah but there is also you might have seen him before remember we were talking about the that episode that we kind of forgot about not to say it's a bad episode but um, the Mandalorian and is helping that younger bounty hunter oh, with the yeah. thing and they go the find filler him. episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, at the end of that, um, the bounty hunter they're after the, um, I forget what her name is. Um, um, the actress is Ming-Na Wen, I think. Um, and she, she's like dead. You think she's dead. And then at the end, somebody come, all you see is like a cape and boots come and grab her. I don't remember if it was a post credit scene or if it was right before the uh, credits rolled. Uh-huh. But there was like a little tag scene where they show. So you might have seen... I. Some people were saying it was Boba Fett, which... Please don't bring Boba Fett into this. Right. Um, right. Uh, mm, I, I, I'm with you. I especially would... If we want to go on what George Lucas gave us, he really wants us to see the, the remade versions that he did of the original trilogy. And like I said, I rewatched some of those recently he adds the sarlacc coming out of the pit you know, in the original right. cut it was a pit that he falls into and there's like a couple of spikes there's straight up a like head that comes out and like munches on mm-hmm. him yeah. and i'm like well, let's just kill him now and let the mandalorian show be its own thing right um, yes so yes, some people please. were saying yeah some people were saying boba fett i hope not but it also could have been john carlos Bezito's character as well his name is uh moff gideon yes yeah yeah. You know, in his first scene where you really see his face, yeah. I was really hoping for him to bring up and sip on a cup that said Boyle Hermanos. <laughs> <laughs> right? I Half mean... of his face is just like burnt off. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, man. Because uh, that dude plays uh, a really good, you know, nerdy badass. You know, it's weird. He's a weird individual because, you know, I he's not a dude I'd probably see in the streets and be scared of. Yeah, but 
Uh, he but scares me. <laughs> he fucking scares me. <laughs> I'll be honest. I didn't watch all of Breaking Bad, but I have seen um, a lot of Gus stuff. Oh. And he's great. And just like out of context clips that I've seen, he's great yeah. and scary as shit. <laughs> yeah. Oh, if you haven't watched Breaking Bad all the way through, um, I, I recommend it. Mm-hmm. And I and just that was a really great series and they ended it where they should have. Um, yeah. That's what I heard. That's a whole side note. Um, <laughs> but yeah, having him in there and his lightsaber yeah so i didn't know much about that uh actually rob oh rob rob well, was the one that uh, gave me the a little dark edgy. saber yeah 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 that's some clone war stuff right there right that's that's full on hit like like i was saying there's there's a lot of stuff that clone wars fans will be excited about because they do talk about it and what that that saber means it's it looks more like a like a straight samurai sword just like glowing black than it does a lightsaber it's got a, a like a hilt like one too yeah. and everything i i love it i'm i'm is it black yeah it's black. okay yeah i'm so i think it's sweet pumped that they brought that into there because um uh they didn't get into any of the history uh, on the show at all um in the mandalorian but the the kind of the backstory with that sword is basically whoever has that sword rules Mandalore or Mandalorians. Oh, yeah. that's right. That's what Rob. It's been saying. it's been like a missing artifact for a long time because it was made by the f- I, there the has first a, Mandalorian made it. It was not the first Mandalorian. It was the first Mandalorian Jedi because oh. there haven't been many Mandalorian Jedi's, but there was one at some point and I forget was it I think his name was Tar Vizsla. There's a house Vizsla that's a prominent house in Mandalorian culture that's been there from for a long time and forget if he was the first Mandalorian Jedi but yeah that was his like lightsaber that's what he built and he also uh it was it was used as uh you know a symbol for the basic ruler of Mandalore it's, it's, that's awesome. it's really cool yeah that's I, gonna there, be exciting to and see. there's gonna be so much more about it too and yeah. I I can't wait to see what they tell us about it in, yeah. in the next coming season but yeah what did you think about that so you didn't you did you haven't watched clone wars right i've watched i think it's the first season okay. and then um i really need to go back and revisit it because um i from you know my my brother and you know one of my cousins my cousin wally what's up wally um wally, wally, wally. <laughs> <laughs> um the, they've shared with me you know um how it really turns into um, great storylines and they touch on so much that expands into all these other projects, yeah. you know? So, um, I'd like, yeah, I really need to make some time and revisit those. Well, what did you think seeing it at the end when he pops out of his downed X wing and he busts out his, his sword? What, what were your thoughts? Were you like, what the hell is this? Yeah. Or? Yeah. I, again, for not knowing the backstory on that, I was like, okay, what? Mm-hmm. You know, now, who is this guy? Is he yeah. a Sith? Because it's only two ways. You get a lightsaber. Either you make one or you steal it. I'm, I, my, my personal thought is that he stole it. Partly because I think they... I don't remember if they say it, but I think he was part of... There was they they mentioned that there was a purge, a Mandalorian purge at right, some point, which right. is why they're all living underground. I think maybe he was a part of it and maybe ended up stealing artifacts from Mandalorian culture or something along the way. But that doesn't discount the fact that he could be like force sensitive somehow. Well, and I I was considering that at that moment when I was like, who is who the fuck is this character mm-hmm. and what's this black lightsaber? Um, I just, you know, knowing Star Wars universe, I don't know of a black lightsaber. So, and yeah. again, I mean, obviously if I would watch Clone Wars, I would have been yeah. educated on it. But so for me, not knowing that no it was research, uh, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Good. Google for Christ's sake. Um, uh, it, it was fun. Cause that, so I shot that thought down right away. Cause I'm like, well, if he, yeah, if he stole it, but who had that lightsaber then mm. who had a black lightsaber that wasn't traditional. Yeah. So um yeah no it that that was really exciting and you know another thing i wanted to touch on that was really fun uh with the mandalorian world was taking the credits that he was 
you know, earning mm-hmm. with credits or just blocks of like uh-huh. platinum or whatever yeah. and turning Best it, scar. Yeah, yeah. And turning it into his armor. Yeah. That, that was a fun, you know, those were fun moments in that series. Yeah. I mean, not only do you get to see a little bit into the world of how like currency works. Cause you know, people want credits or this, that or the other, and this dude's taking like metal for armor yeah. for payment. Um, which is awesome. It's like vibranium or some shit. <laughs> you can like <laughs> deflect Wolverine. <laughs> Just throw Wolverine at him and he's good. He's yeah. Like, Fuck it. <laughs> um, not only do you see that, the, um, the expansion of, of the world, but you, you get to see, um, little bit more insight into the mandalorian culture that way too of like oh this is just this is like a material that they use Mm -hmm. specifically that you know after whatever cleansing of the mandalorian culture or mandalorian people happen like you still get little bits of all this stuff and that's that's a good thing about season two is they they kind of wrapped up ultimately this was a pretty self-contained first season like it's the baby yoda arc you know Right. Get him, get him there, and then steal him back. And then there's a couple of like filler episodes mm-hmm. along the way, um, but they did a really good job of all these little things. So like, there's not to me. I don't have huge questions of like, it, this wasn't a cliffhanger epi- uh, series ending for me at all. But there's enough there that I'm like, well, fuck yeah, what's I'm watching next? the rest of this. Like, yeah, let's see, next? let's see, let's see him get more Beskar or paint his armor you know maybe he doesn't look like a a a soda can with no label (laughs) which i don't get me wrong i i like both versions of his armor that he's had so far i think it looks cool but maybe he gets a paint job in the next season or something he looks like a uh you know a kicker's uniform in football (laughs) it's pretty clean (laughs) (laughs) guy's not getting dragged in the mud no grass stains exactly (laughs) Um, what were your thoughts on the first time you saw baby Yoda use the force? I was surprised because, um, you know, as we talked about, there's not many Yoda species in the universe at all. And the only two that we've seen are, were both on the Jedi council. So, I mean, I, I started to ask questions. Are all of these species force sensitive? Right. Um, uh, when the fuck did Yoda get down with Yaddle? <laughs> right. Why wasn't I there? Yeah. Or invited? Yeah. And like, um, why didn't he take him to Dagobah with him? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what happened to Yaddle? Did, did she go to Yaga- Dagobah too? Right. Were they just getting down in the swamps and then she right. died and then Luke shows up and Yoda's all crazy when you see him because he just lost his wife and his kid ran off. I don't know. <laughs> I think you're onto something. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I was I was genuinely surprised um, because they do some cool stuff. You know, like he he lifts the like what do they call it mud horn or whatever. Yeah. Or when he's when Mandalorian's getting the shit kicked out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, which that's cool. I like to see a, a character that isn't like the best. You know, right. The Mandalorian constantly gets his ass kicked. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, like pretty bad. Too. Yeah. I'm really disappointed in you, uh, Dornishman. <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> There's that fucking staff of yours. That yeah. Keep flinging around. <laughs> um, no, I like the, I like the, uh, that he gets his ass kicked and that um, it shows he's human. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, as human as you are in the <laughs> in <laughs> Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I think the force with baby Yoda, the baby Yoda thing is, is interesting because yeah, I have all these questions. Uh, are they all force sensitive? Uh, what not? But I also, it, it does kind of set up some, some plot holes in my head. Um, after watching empire Yoda, uh, he, he says he trained Jedi for 800 years mm-hmm. and this baby is 50 years old. <laughs> so, just kind of doing the math like yeah did he start training jedi when he was like two <laughs> it's like men- mentality wise right um so yeah there's a couple of things i, th- I think about but I, ultimately i like i like that he's force sensitive it gives um it, it gives an edge to the mandalorian show where you know a lot of people like star wars because it has to do with force and like these weird magical powers in space but i like that they did it because now you don't have to you're not obligated to 
try to have to bring in like Luke Skywalker. Yeah. Because he exists in this time frame, but is and I mean, you know, we only is know he he's the character, only character though. Yeah, yeah, we don't we don't need him with the Mandalorian. Like right. maybe a one episode with them crossing over to maybe get Sebastian Stan in the in the costume for the first time <laughs> might be a good a good idea. But you don't need to do that because you have the Yoda character, this little baby Yoda force user, kind of holding on to that. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it brings up some questions for me, but I ultimately like it, too, because it, 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 it's also part of the story. You know, um, he, the, the, the baby Yoda kill, help, helped him with the mud horn, and then he goes back to the Mandalorians, and they're like, let me make you the sigil. And he's like, I can't. It wasn't a clean kill. The, the, my enemy killed it or helped me kill it. And, and they're like, what the what's going on with yeah. you like what's up and then at the end they end up giving them the like mud horn sig- sigil anyways right and it, it all kind of comes back around but yeah I, I i i think it works well um and also the other thing with it is it set precedent for some of the stuff that happens in rise of skywalker um and i think done much better <laughs> um and the thing i'm talking specifically about is like force healing um thank you they do that in in um, the Mandalorian very well, you know. Like somebody needs it, and it's not just like, oh, I can heal everybody all the time. Right. Like they they did in Rise of Skywalker. They set up a very specific story. Certain people could do this. It took certain training, and maybe you had to die to even get that complete that training complete. Um, and then all of a sudden, Rise of Skywalker, everybody can everybody can do it. Right. And just like I'm gonna kiss you, and then. Right, you're alive now. Right, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I thought it was it was a better use of that kind of power, and we haven't fully seen it in a movie or anything like that. The, the healing factor so much that I can think of, um, but now that it exists, I prefer the Mandalorian explanation or you know use of that as right. opposed to just the other the other just, thing. Yeah, I was, yeah, I, I totally <laughs> agree with you on that one. Because uh, Dude, Rise of Skywalker, there's, like, three fake deaths in that movie. <laughs> Something <laughs> like that. Like, Chewie, C-3PO, Ben, and Rey yeah. all die. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, like... And Disney uh, should have just only, let them die. And only one of them actually stays dead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, th- I think that the, the show again going back to all the same things it 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 fills in um better storytelling than what we've been getting uh there's something a little bit planned out which i think goes to the people behind the show john favreau and dave filoni um john favreau is like we were saying he help, we don't have mcu the same way we have without him he did jungle book movie i mean mm-hmm. he's done a bunch of stuff yeah that's just yeah, he he single-handedly has made disney billions of dollars and billions of dollars and he's t- kind of taken over the star wars right it seems like it there's nothing official yet okay but if there was somebody uh, yeah if there was somebody that should maybe take over uh uh the head of lucasfilm in that capacity i think maybe he would he should be the person but the other person that i i really think needs to stay there too is dave filoni who's who's directed some uh, i think one or two episodes of mandalorian and his co show running it with dave uh with uh john favreau and i say that because he worked with um george lucas for a long time he co-created uh-huh. the clone wars um, I think he show he ran that whole thing. Um, a lot of the characters, uh, well, some of the characters from the Clone Wars, like Ahsoka Tano, who's Anakin's Padawan in the, um, that's a, a original creation from him. Um, and he worked with George for a long time on this. And uh, uh, there's a kind of a famous story of um, uh, George comes up to him and is like, "Yeah, I want to bring Darth Maul back." And Dave Filoni's like, "Well, how do you want to do it?" And he's like, "I don't know. You figure it out." <laughs> <laughs> and so that's where Darth, that's how Darth Maul comes back, <laughs> essentially. Yeah. Um, but Dave Filoni understands the world. He worked with George for a long time. That's and huge. Think, yeah, that is yeah. huge. Yeah. And I think those two, those two together, I mean, Mandalorian is proving to be a pretty solid piece of Star Wars material right now. So if you, if they want to do more stuff like that. As far as I'm concerned, take as much time to do another movie as you want. If you don't do another for movie sure. for five years, just give me three more <laughs> series in the meantime. Right. You know? Right. Because um, these these are these are well done, and it's a new medium that they get to play in. So um, yeah, I, I I like I like the direction of of 
where Star Wars is now, not necessarily with the movies, but everything else. Um, I think the direction that the the people that are running these, Dave and 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 John, I think they really understand. Um, I, they understand the material and why people love it, not just like people like this. Let's make money, you know. Right. He'll make them money because John Favreau seems to generate billions of dollars for Disney. <laughs> it's in his DNA. But um, but at the same time, he's also he's going to care about people wanting to come back and watch more. Right. Because that's an important thing too that I think Disney kind of overlooked is there's a bit of a cash grab to make these movies these last couple of movies and you hurt star wars because it it, when you put out a bad movie it's an uphill battle to get people to want to watch another one Mm -hmm. Uh, because you're like well these last ones sucked or you know i didn't like these for these reasons so it's it's an uphill battle to get people to come back to even a big intellectual property like star wars but you can't upset fans as much as they've been consistently doing with all of their movies. I mean, some people didn't like force awakens. Some people loved it. And then, um, rogue one still people are like, some people like that's the worst of all the star Wars movies. <laughs> yeah. I'm I like, heard that too. I'm like, that, I don't that, see that. Yeah. <laughs> but Hey, you know, teach their own. Uh, yeah. And then, that, no Cause I, I love, I actually really enjoyed episode seven and mm-hmm. I don't know if it's because I was starving for something new in the yeah. star Wars world. And, and I, you know, and I, yeah, it was a big copycat of episode four, but it, for mm-hmm. me, it was, uh, I enjoyed that. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed that it was brought back. Um, so we can create a new foundation and build off of that. And sadly yeah. they, you know, and then again, you, then you had people, you know, hate, uh, last Jedi mm-hmm. or, or loved it. Yeah. You know, I feel like the majority hated it, but I, then the more I talked to people is kind of more like a 50, 50. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm still kind of split on it too. There's parts of it I really like. There's parts of it I really, really don't like. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I, th- I, I think part of the problem with the inflated um, like hatred in the Star Wars community was Last Jedi was kind of divisive, and then usually you wait a year or so before like they were doing them every Christmas. But it was um, they put out the Last Jedi. And then in May, they they dropped Solo. And so it was like, you, even Solo should have been pushed back another six, six eight months. Yeah. Something like that. And then that movie was just, most people don't like that movie. Well, and because of Last Jedi, and then because just the previews on Solo, I, I didn't even watch it. Yeah. Didn't watch it in the theater. I, one night, I finally was like, there was nothing on. I fell asleep to it. Mm-hmm. Um so didn't even I can't even tell you, you know, about it. But yeah, I was I was not even enthused to go see Solo after right. the Last Jedi. But um, you know, getting back to the Mandalorian, what would you grade it? Oh, um, this is a tough thing to do because there's so much good like TV out there. Last week we did our Watchmen review, and man, that Watchmen to me is one of the current single greatest uh tv seasons series any mini series whatever you want to call yeah. it ever um and not just a comic book thing um mandalorian i'm really really excited uh about i think i'm less excited about like maybe that they've set up certain story points that i need to see or anything like that i'm just really excited about what they're doing um, I like the casting. I know there's people that, uh, like we mentioned, Bill Burr and his Boston accent. <laughs> I know there's other people that didn't appreciate Amy Sedaris because she pops up once or twice in the show. I love Amy Sedaris, and I, I don't really care if people didn't think she fit in in Star Wars universe. Cause was she the bounty hunter? No, she was... Um, in one of the episodes, he goes to get his car. His, his car. He goes to get his like ship worked on. Oh. And she's the one with like the perm. She's and the she, mechanic. Yeah, she yeah. looks. She looks like um uh Ripley from Alien. <laughs> she looks like just like a, like a like a, a broke down version yeah. of, of Ripley. Um, but I I don't know. I love Amy Sedaris and put her back in another episode. Don't listen to everybody else. She's great. <laughs> um, 
No, I it's it's that's it's a really hard thing to grade because I'm I'm really positive on this show, but mm-hmm. you know, there's a lot of really good shows out there. Yeah. So it's 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 hard to compare um uh I don't know. There's there's definitely really strong um strong episodes that I could compare to really positive or really strong episodes of other series. Um I don't think there's anything that fits the like Battle of the Bastards or the Hooded Justice episode of Watchmen in Mandalorian yeah. yet. Yep. But just give it time. I yeah. they still have time to, to get there. Game of Thrones didn't really get there until seasons into it you know like yeah. they progressed into their cinematography at, right. at a certain point but um right. uh yeah i for for just just for just for this episode i'll give it a, i'll give it an a wow. an a All yeah right. and this is this is with a a plus a minus b you know this is this is a solid a yeah solid a uh i maybe put watchman as a as an a plus Nice. So if that that's how I'll grade it. Nice. Yeah. yeah. What what what's your grading? On this? Um, it's funny because I'm praising it this whole time, but I will give it a B plus. B plus. Okay. Yeah. Um, I want to see more. Um, I want to see more of it. I want to see. Um, I don't know if it's because I'm skeptical right now. <laughs> Disney. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then you you also nailed it. Like you're if we're gonna you know compare it to other you know series out there. Um, it's got a lot of shoes to fill. Yeah, currently, I mean, yeah. you just this last five years of um, series. Um, so uh, I am d- I don't you know I'm not hating on it with that B plus. I'm very excited to see where this is going to go. Uh, I guess I'm giving it that B plus because I want to just see room for improvement with yeah. more, you yeah. know. And and uh, but I, I'm I'm stoked. This is exciting and. Uh, yeah, it was fun to discuss it today. Yeah, I, I, I mean, we both really like Star Wars, so these, <laughs> these episodes could go for two hours. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> Hope nobody fell asleep in the car, <laughs> ran off the road. And if you do, it was Dusty's fault. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Dusty, uh, thanks for coming in today. Oh, man, thank you. Um, it was so, so much fun being here. Uh, I feel like you're the unofficial co-host <laughs> of the show. <laughs> so whenever, whenever Goals. you're available. <laughs> Goals. Um, yeah, thanks again for coming on. And uh, we're going to take a commercial break and come back when we and we'll talk about the music peace love peace you still got pets they still trying to get married we got hamsters or something well whatever you got consider having a big day at richard's pet wedding facilities we've got chairs and grass look at this log and this nervous guy we remodeled recently, so it's like a brand new magical paradise next to the same dumpster that you're used to off exit 7. Richard's Pet Wedding Facilities. Only the best for your pets. From the day you were born to the day you die, we are there. From the drugs you consume to the food you eat, we made that. When you are at work, or being intimate. We are watching. Robots have always been here and always will. Friendly because we choose to be. Our oceans have become more and more polluted and it's displacing and wiping out entire species. But there is one species that needs a little extra help. The elusive Tupoctopus has lost its home in the deep sea, and the rise of mumble rap has negatively affected mating rituals. So please, help us save the Tupoctopus. Welcome back. Welcome back, you heathens, to the Virtual Crate <laughs> Podcast. I'm your your dirtbag host, Jonathan Dinosaur. Jonathan T. Dinosaur the third. John John T. Dino. Dino T. Ward the third. Um 
We're back again with Pat. Pat's here again. Back again. Got and, some more music news. Yeah, we got some. We got some stuff to talk. To, to, wow, to talk to, 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 to talk about. To, 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 to. <laughs> I'm a dirtbag. <laughs> uh, no, we got some stuff I'm your to host, talk Gert about. <laughs> we actually do have some stuff to talk about today. Um, Winter Nam. Yeah, the Nam show just happened. Just happened, and so there's a bunch of new this music last gear. Quite a bit to talk about. Yeah, uh, Pat. Pat is a little bit more of a gear file than I am, and so I'm gonna let Pat uh, just tell us about all the cool stuff that's coming out this year. Uh, what what do we got? What do we got up first, Pat? What's uh, what's some of the highlights for you? Oh, there are several, but a big first standout that I'd like to talk about is Behringer. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know how much they actually showed at Nam, but they always do this where they'll like drop uh, new gear right around the time of Winter Nam. Uh huh. Just kind of take some of the focus away from there and put them on themselves, I guess. Yeah. Their style. And, of course, in the same Behringer fashion, not coming out with any new products, but products that were... Other people have put out. Yeah, that have, made, <laughs> have been made famous and sought highly sought after stuff, really. Like the ARP 2600, um, famous semi-modular synthesizer. We mentioned it before, the voice mm. of R2-D2. Yeah. Uh-huh. So really just iconic piece of gear. So what you're saying Super is... Super expensive on the used market. I mean, this stuff is going up for upwards of eight, dollars $9,000, you know, when you can find them. So what you're telling me is Behringer old... is re-releasing older people's gear, older company, <laughs> other companies' gear, but for cheaper prices? That's 100% what they're doing and what they have Fantastic. been doing. Since they've gotten into the synthesizer game, I believe their first release was... The Deep Mind. Uh-huh. I think you've, yeah, you've seen I've this seen before. The Deep, the Deep Mind. Mind. The Deep Mind 12. Yeah. Kind of has that Juno, the classic Roland Juno architecture. Mm-hmm. But they've added their effects with their, because they have uh, TC Electronic. That's they added cat Behringer. sounds to it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> has some more cat sounds that they kind of. It's a Juno mixed with one of those Target keyboards. <laughs> the, the, the Meowzik. The, the Meowzik keyboards yeah. from Target. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't notice any new Meowzik releases at, a, uh, at NAMM. <laughs> There could have been. I just didn't notice them. But yeah, Behringer um, cloning the Moog System 55 modular, mo- classic famous modules from the old Moog modular, like switched on, you know, mm-hmm. switched on Bach and um, Popcorn. Wendy Carlos. She <laughs> used it also on um, on the Clockwork Orange score. Gotcha. There's another like Moog, but there are I mean, several. You can, all those old like Emerson, Lake and Palmer videos with yeah. uh, Keith Emerson on the Moog modular. It's like a, like a furniture, you know, bookshelf of <laughs> yeah. modules. Takes up half a room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Takes like five dudes to wheel it onto stage. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and also the Roland, classic Roland System 100. That was Roland's modular. Um, kind of established like the Ro- that Roland sound back in the 70s. So these are just classic modular synthesizers from the 70s that uh, to most musicians especially musicians that don't have a huge budget aren't professional musicians this is their first opportunity to get modules from that you know from Mm -hmm. those classic Mm -hmm. or based on those classic machines um at a much cheaper cost i think the cheaper parts and stuff like that i think well way cheaper parts i think the behringer modules are only going to be like 100 to 200 dollars per module (laughs) so you can build a classic moog style modular synthesizer for less than a thousand bucks which is just unheard of. I mean, yeah. Moog themselves have re-released, and Moog is an awesome company. I yeah. love their stuff, love their sound, but they've uh, re-released a couple of their classic modulars, and those are like the cheapest ones, like eight, nine grand, something like that. <laughs> It's not cheap. I got and... nine grand just laying around. Hold on. I got to go buy a synth real quick, guys. <laughs> I mean, these are for people who really are passionate about yeah. that sound and want that sound or want that piece of history, which I completely understand. I mean, Korg also released um, uh, uh, like almost one-to-one mm. uh, of the ARP 2600. They bought the rights for ARP a few years ago, released the Odyssey, um, a mono synth from... Uh, around the same time, a little bit later than the 2600, but kind of based around the 2600, but all enclosed. Sort of how the Mini Moog was uh, a riff on the Moog modular system, just brought down for touring musicians mm. and, you know, accessible for just regular keyboardists. For using. <laughs> yeah, it's not, you don't have to have Keith Emerson and a team of five dudes to wheel <laughs> yeah. it onto stage. You have to have a trailer just for that piece of gear. <laughs> I'm, I'm, they probably did. Yeah. Probably had its own uh, 
cargo storage spot on the plane. Back when the music industry used to be like super full of money, just throwing money at everybody. Yeah, no, well, <laughs> yeah, maybe a little bit before the Fleetwood Mac rumor, Fleetwood Mac rumor days, <laughs> where they just had like. I, I think I, I don't know how true this is, but I remember hearing something about how Fleetwood Mac just had like a room in their mansion that they where they were recording rumors because mm-hmm. they recorded rumors like famously in a mansion, and uh, it, there was one room that was like the entire floor was mattresses or something. Uh, that, that, that doesn't surprise me at all. I thought you were gonna say there was one just cocaine room. I was like, Pfft, I'm sure, sure every room was a cocaine. I'm sure room. that I'm sure that mattress room was also the cocaine. Room. Yeah, no, it's probably every room in the house. <laughs> yeah. He's like walk out to the kitchen. There's oh, is this pa- like a you know granulated sugar dough? No, it's not. <laughs> well, we don't con- but, condone the cocaine use, moving but on we from do Behringer, condone mattresses on the floor. Yeah, Behringer. So, I mean, we'll we'll see what happens. They've already cloned like several of the classic mono synths. I can't say that I have too much experience with their stuff, but everybody seems to be talking about it in the whole synthesizer user community Mm -hmm. i own some baron i've owned some behringer stuff um not synthesizers i have those powered speakers um i would say my experience with behringer oh and that mixer um, yeah you you get what you pay for but but we'll see what the synthesizer game's like because that's a completely different kind of we'll see and uh, most of their offerings have just been modules Mm -hmm. you know not so much of the the keys or anything but they did also before nam release uh their poly d is what they <laughs> called poly it. d <laughs> which is really the parrot the, the parody but nobody wants to make a product called parody well nobody should make it because it's not really true the, the poly d <laughs> it's not really polyphonic either but of course based on the moog model d based on uh <laughs> real housewives of new jersey <laughs> <laughs> But uh, so there were also, I mean, there were several more offerings from Dam that stood out to me. Another one is from Sequential, previously Dave Smith Instruments. Oh, okay. Um, they, sequen- so back they, in the day, they Dave were Smith sequential circuits. Name? I guess I missed this. So they were sequential circuits back in the 70s, 80s. Okay. The Prophet 5, the classic yeah, Prophet yeah. 5, gotcha. Pro 1, um, Pro 1 based on the Prophet 5 being a single voice, and they, uh, several other synthesizers i mean and drum machines they had the um the sequential drum tracks mm-hmm. that's a cool sounding drum machine from the 80s just a, a lot of cool gear um throughout the years from dave smith and company but before it was just dave smith instruments they had the evolver the polyvolve polyvolver um leading all the way up to the prophet 12 the pro 2 which i have i have a pro 2 and then uh released now the pro 3 under the sequential banner. Real quick, was that drum machine that's uh, that you're talking about? Was that the one that Prince used on his earlier stuff? I, I think that's famously the Lin drum. The Lin drum. Okay. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're Maybe right. the Oberheim D- DMX or DX as well, but D- yeah, the, <laughs> that's where it came from. Yeah, that's yeah. where his name came from. Was yeah. from that drum machine. But um, no, the uh, the Lin drum. That's a classic piece. Yeah, no, I, I like that sound. I, I like too. that sound of drum. And when you hear that Prince sound, you like when you hear the Lynn drum, you're like, okay, I yeah. hear that Prince song right <laughs> yeah. there. Um, so what Dave did, Smith, the, the yeah, pro, what did or, so the sequential pro three, um, two analog oscillators, uh, they had their profit. The first instrument so far released under the sequential moniker was the profit six. Mm hmm. And that was, I think, Dave Smith's first kind of offering with the VCOs, with vi- voltage-controlled oscillators, which people, I think, pretty much universally prefer mm-hmm. uh, to digital oscillators or digitally controlled oscillator DCO, like the Juno. This is nerd stuff, though. <laughs> and then uh, that's why you're here. I wanted uh, to get uh, you to talk about some nerd stuff. Yeah, definitely could get into it. But they kept the uh, they kept a lot of stuff from the Pro Two, the awesome sequencer which has up to 16 tracks. So you all, it's so easy to use too. Like you just hold down the record button, tweak a parameter, mm-hmm. and then that'll be captured into the sequencer up to 32 steps. And you can chain those 32 step patterns together too. Mm-hmm. And sequence external gear. Um, I think that they kept the same CV, the same control voltage inputs and outputs from the Pro 2, which has four CV ins, four CV outs. So you can interface that with modular gear. Get some of that cheap Behringer gear we were just talking Sweet, about. let's do it. And hook that up with the Pro 3. Watch it just... And um, two, they also released two different versions of the, the Pro 3. 
One of them being kind of the mini Moog style with the cabinet where it tilts up, uh -huh. the panel tilts, yeah. which is awesome. I mean, I think that helps big time for playing and live tweaking and mm -hmm. stuff where if it has a panel up yeah. at an angle where you can actually access the controls the knobs. versus something that's The big flat. knobs. Oh, and there is a big filter knob here, which is always solid. Yeah, Mo, Mo always, did that on that sub thirty seven. Also, because Pat, Pat's got a plug in that he called the big knob. Oh, he, the one knob. The one knob. That yeah, he for waves. Is. Yeah, good it stuff. just looks Those funny. Are, that's a good series it right just, there. No, it looks like super functional. It's just, it's just funny because it's like one big knob, literally just one big. It's knob. yeah, just one knob, literally one knob. Uh, the one knob pumper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like a side chain effect Dude, it's quick and dirty and it stays those are good effects um so uh what else is coming out from from them do you got any um you got any like effects pedals or anything like that that you that not necessarily out? effects pedals but uh universal audio was a big surprise kind of have a daw a digital audio workstation no way in the works that's that's and their interfaces have been hugely popular i mean you see yeah. people using their interfaces all the time and for good reason i mean those, they, those are some of the only interfaces that i know of to include processing power on board yeah to take some of the weight off of your computer one of the kind of uh, uh one of the pieces of gear i've been looking at for the last like year or so is a new uh audio input and i ua is kind of the direction i'm looking yeah i mean that's one of the big names and their whole um, approach to this piece of software has been i think remarkable and i don't know why more aren't on board with this as well but trying to reduce latency mm -hmm. when recording and when monitoring it's a big live. problem in digital recording for it, sure it has been throughout the years and i think it's just now starting to really get better with computers yeah. being more powerful but as computers become more powerful software is also utilizing that yeah. power more and more so you have more plugins and uh soft synth stuff like that that are eating up cpu power yeah so why not have an interface to offset that and yeah. then now with um universal audios there it's called luna their interface luna, luna. That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. Does it, um, I use Apollo because their interfaces are Apollo yeah. and then Luna <laughs> kind of sticking with that moon. Yeah. Um, theme. I use, did you, did you see much of this? No, you didn't actually go to N N NAM, but I know, I, that's I know true. You, I didn't, I, I know, but you, I have been following it pretty closely and, maybe, and maybe, I, I've watched maybe a couple we can videos get you on there it. next year. <laughs> so they're, they're also releasing their own soft synths kind of native to this program. Mm -hmm. Um, one of them being based on the mini Moog, which a lot of people have done emulations of, but this one I believe is official. I think Moog is, endorsing it too oh, interesting yeah and uh seem seems to look pretty good along with uh like a virtual neve console that knowing universal audio their stuff always sounds good so i'm yeah. sure this is going to sound great too and mm -hmm. their approach the guy that i saw the the uh spokesperson for universal audio kept saying it's not a it's not a daw but sure looks like a daw to me yeah yeah um, <laughs> very reminiscent of logic with the uh which is nice with the colored um, waveforms and everything, like the different colors. So it looks kind of like Logic. It looks quite a bit like Logic. That's nice because I use Logic. It and, looks good. Yeah, um, it's always good to to know that there's multiple softwares out there that are that'll be good to use. I mean, there's a lot of softwares out there today. I do a lot of media and um, you know video editing. There's there's a handful of video editors. Editor kind of the same names software, though for for like a long time, right? Final Cut. Yeah, Final Cut, Premiere, um, Premier. there's um Sony Vegas is another one. I used I used to use that at the state one of the stations I worked at. I don't I don't like Vegas as much, but but uh again in in all media there's there's a lot of new softwares that I mean even the free softwares for um for audio software um are much better than they used to yeah, be. I mean they just I I loved this Universal so Audio offering because they took that approach of we want to reduce latency down yeah. to something that is negligible that producers artists mm. aren't even gonna have to worry about they just you just turn on your computer you open up this program you're ready to start Good laying to stuff down yeah that's how it should be yeah yeah um so Universal Audio has got a digital audio workstation huh. That's that's interesting. That is something I might actually look into a little yeah. bit too. I wonder if they're gonna do um, with uh, some other companies when you buy like a piece of gear. Like let's say I buy a new audio oh, interface. Yeah. I wonder they if they might gonna include do like a like a free software. Light version. Yeah, something like that. I can that. definitely see that. I'd, I'd try that out for sure. Um, 
was there was there any other uh, pieces of news from them uh yeah korg um had as i mentioned before some good offerings too like their uh new products they have a few that i noticed one of them being called the op six mm-hmm. uh six operator fm synth so based like kind of around the dx7 but with more real-time hands-on so it's like an r3 <laughs> not, not quite like the r3 that's yeah that's the radius engine the yeah. r3 and uh no but they seem to always be coming up with new stuff often based on their previous uh iteration the like previous synths from the mm-hmm. 80s 70s uh ms20 full size interesting um a lot what, of people weren't happy with the mini i the, find it to be fine i have yeah, one myself little but plasticky keys though a I'm little, sure. oh the whole thing is very plasticky yeah. it has those uh i love how the patch points are just little rivets that are glued on they're not actual <laughs> rivets <laughs> i mean a couple things awesome. like that but it still sounds great and i've heard people complaining a lot about like the noise issue mm-hmm. if you have a vintage synthesizer presumably there's going to be some noise yeah like i know in my on my juno 6 um if you have the chorus engaged you can see visually that there is noise from that co- just from usually the usually when you're making Not music playing any... there is noise <laughs> yeah, there's, you would hope to get some sort of output no but they're saying that like there's just too much noise and yeah. that it interferes with the recording process but it has not been my issue anyway we're getting uh ms20s in four different colors you can get army green maybe blue <laughs> see uh, black and white if they did seafoam green green i'm, I'm in. oh dude that's <laughs> I, I do like seafoam green guitars i do too yeah, I, it's I always do, a cool you know, it's funny because i you've seen uh, pat's known me for a really long time and i've had a bunch of different guitars i've never bought a guitar that's like a colorful guitar like that it's usually like a solid black solid like i had uh one solid red guitar at one point no i had two there was uh, i had like that early sg that i had the, i think it was maybe your first electric guitar right? epiphone yeah epiphone sg and then um the uh um the Gretsch. The Gretsch that I had the was, Gretsch Corvette. was red. Yeah. That's my that's my only regret in life <laughs> is giving that guitar up. <laughs> yeah, I kinda wish I could talk about other aspects of NAM, but I just don't follow it too closely, like yeah. the uh, the new tubas. <laughs> 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 um, no, the, the Nam Nam has a lot of Nam stuff. Nam is huge. Yeah, this yeah, is a huge convention at the Anaheim Convention Center. Yeah, they get We've into got a place to stay at Eads. <laughs> we gotta go. It, hey, Na, uh, give us Nam. Give us some uh, some uh, invites next year, and Ian, we're staying at your house. Yeah, <laughs> this is a formal invite for ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so Nam has a lot of stuff. They they cater to pretty much every every, every aspect of every the aspect music. of music. Yeah. So we we just talked about a little bit. Pat Pat likes a lot of recorded gear and synthesizers and stuff like that. I tend to go a little bit more guitar, um, effects pedals, stuff like that. But I also don't follow gear as much as Pat does uh, because he just likes looking at buttons. <laughs> Who likes, doesn't like to stare at knobs? He likes twisted knobs. Yeah. <laughs> um. Cool. Was that is that was that the that was the biggest thing that that was came out from Nam, right? Was the uh, Universal Audio? I, that's one of the biggest things for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. I mean, there were several, but yeah. Again, that was for me personally. That was one of the biggest. And then, um, Korg's Wave State, oh, uh-huh. which is a really interesting looking synthesizer. It looks different from anything that I have or have uh, played in the past. And I think it comes from their. Uh, wave station Mm -hmm. but it's enhanced with more like real-time controls it has this joystick so you can like morph between different patches and sequence during like it's all just really it looks like a really cool machine for building atmospheres or like pads Mm -hmm. stuff Mm -hmm. like that and it has some of their um model filters after like the poly six some just some classic like analog model filters too i gotta say as much as i was kind of maybe leaning into Behringer being a little cheap or whatever. I do appreciate that companies like Behringer and Korg are making with their Volca really series. awesome, yeah. awesome gear that accessible is accessible for anybody. Yeah. And, um, I mean, both Pat and I have had various, uh, vocal, or uh, vocal, Volca or, um, what was the, the mono tribe? The mono tribe. Mo- monotron. I think Monot- is what they originally I, started with. I had both. I had yeah. the monotron and the mono tribe. Yeah, those were good. Those, the, the those little delay one was awesome. I still have that. <laughs> do you? Yeah. We should 
<laughs> we should mess with that one of these days. Um, well, I think we're going to get out of here for this episode. Um, we'll, uh, we'll talk some more music gear one of these days. I want to, I want to hear what everybody thinks about, um, winter nam if there's yeah, anything what else they did, want to what know did we about miss? yeah what did we miss or if you're not a musician and you just found this conversation interesting what do you want to know more about uh is there anything that we can we can exp- uh dive into in further conversations that you guys want to know about um so i guess for this episode uh i'm gonna say bye i'm i've i've been your dirtbag host uh <laughs> hagrid <laughs> and, and I'll, I'll be back soon to talk more music yeah pat will be back so um yeah for uh for this episode of the virtual crate later later